Coming up in today's newscast, Justice Minister Ayala Chaked claims that Prime Minister Netanyahu's remaining days in office are dwindling. Israel and the United States withdraw completely from the international heritage organization UNESCO. And ILTV takes a look back at some of the biggest Israeli headlines of 2018. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu commented for the first time on the formation of Education Minister Naftali Bennett and Justice Minister Ayelet Chaked's new Hayamin HaChadash, or the New Right Party. In closed-door comments to senior Likud officials, Netanyahu reportedly said that, quote, Bennett and Chaked are destroying right-wing parties that will not pass the electoral threshold, adding that this could represent a, quote, fatal blow to the national camp that could lead to the establishment of a leftist government, end quote. Well, according to a number of recent polls, several right-wing parties, including the Jewish Home, which Bennett and Shaked broke away from, as well as Shas, Kulanu, and Israel Beitenu, were all hovering around the 3.25 electoral threshold, or around a minimum of four seats. And if any one of these parties doesn't make it into the Knesset, it could certainly jeopardize the right's leading bloc. However, some reports suggest actually that the two ministers, Bennett and Shaked, will seek to reunite with their Jewish Home Party following the elections, in order to create a strong right-wing bloc in coalition negotiations with the Prime Minister. And on a related note, on Monday, Justice Minister Ayelet Chaked also said that she believes this will be Netanyahu's last term in office. Speaking at a conference by financial paper Kalkalist, Chaked explained that her prediction is because Netanyahu is getting older and faces indictment charges which loom over him. She added that she doesn't know what the investigation into the prime minister will yield, though she hopes there will be nothing so that the government can get back to work as usual. Still, for the upcoming elections, Shaked said that she hopes her new party will remain partners in his coalition and that she and Bennett both are aiming to try to bring in mandates in the double digits. Since the announcement of their new party, though, Likud party members have publicly criticized Bennett and Shaked for their move. Mr. Yariv Levine on Sunday even said in a post on Facebook that, quote, from their wild attack on Prime Minister Netanyahu, it's clear that Bennett and Shaked's intention is to topple the prime minister and the Likud, end quote. Israel is often looked at from the West as a strategic partner in the Middle East, but what does that mean? Well, for one, it means that the Jewish state is the eyes and the ears on the ground in the Middle East for much of the rest of the world, and with Israel's intelligence gathering capabilities, it's no wonder why we're the top choice for the job. For example, after 15 years, new reports in Israeli media Monday revealed that Israeli intelligence participation was crucial in the capturing of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Well, there are plenty of other similar reports as well, and here to discuss the importance of Israel's intelligence sharing is Dr. Martin Sherman, the founder and executive director of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. Dr. Sherman, as always, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for the invitation again. All right, so let's, you know, what kind of intelligence does Israel regularly share, and what kind of intelligence does Israel maybe keep to herself? Well, let me say at the outset that I don't have any specific knowledge of operational uh, activities in the intelligence community. But uh, there are uh, open sources reports, uh, like for instance, uh, in uh, March, uh, Israeli intelligence apparently helped foil a terrorist attack on an aircraft uh, in Australia. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, in June, they apparently helped the French foil a terrorist attack on French soil. And there were reports uh, later in the year that the Israeli intelligence was also instrumental in foiling a terrorist attack in Denmark. So even from, uh, even from open sources, we can uh, deduce that the, that the Israeli intelligence has a central role in, uh, in keeping the security of uh, Western countries. Okay, well, you know, I know that you were in kind of the intelligence uh, field for, for a little while uh, here in Israel. So, you know, how, how does Israel go about forming that type of intelligence abroad? Because I know that here in Israel, you know, and, and in the Palestinian territories, we have a, a vast network um, of intelligence that's coming in. Well, uh, you know, I sh one of the things is the things that happen abroad have connections in this region as well. I mean, if someone is going to plan a, 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 an attack abroad, the directions may come from some Middle Eastern uh, locality. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, it's no secret that uh, the Israeli intelligence services have vast resources at their disposal, perhaps not quite as much as the CIA or the, or the, or the Russians, but they have vast resources. They have very dedicated uh, uh, members working for them. And um, 
But, 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 but you're right, you know, there's a big difference in telling people what you know and, and, and how you got it. But sometimes exposing what you know might actually uh, expose how you got it, which is a serious dilemma. You know, what do you do if you have a, 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 actionable, a, a you have actionable intelligence? Uh, what do you do? You always got to weigh against it of, of you, know, you know exposing sources which may be valuable down the line. So it's sometimes a very difficult uh, difficult call mm -hmm. to make. Now let, let's look at Syria for for another example. Now you know with the United States right now you have multiple uh, officials in the United States, including actually Senators Graham and Rubio, saying that you know the United States is going to slow down on the withdrawal from Syria, uh, the troop withdrawal from Syria. So. Does Israeli, do you think Israeli intelligence had anything to do with that decision, or really is it kind of up in the air with the Trump White House? Well, I, I, as I say, I don't have any specific sure. knowledge about messages that were conveyed. Uh, I, I'm sure Israel expressed an opinion, but you know, Israel has always been very clear about not having foreign forces uh, you, uh, endanger their lives for Israel. You know, Israel has this long standing policy of doing its own fighting. Uh, I, I think that uh, the decision to pull out of Syria was far more uh, important and significant for the Kurds than for Israel. Um, you know, Israel showed that basically much of what going on, what's going on in uh, Syria is transparent to it. We saw the massive coup in uh, Iran where Israel came away with it, a trove of, of documents. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's probably better for Israel if that the Americans stay there. But I'm not sure that this would be an issue on which it would be worthwhile to cause friction between us and the Trump administration. Um, so, you know, this is something that Trump has promised for a long time. And I don't think that the Israeli government can complain much about Trump's policy towards Israel, you know, moving the embassy across uh, sure. and uh, recognizing Jerusalem and defunding uh, UNRWA and stepping up the sanctions on, on Iran. So, so certainly I, you know, I, I don't think that this is sort of the same order of magnitude uh, that the, the, other, the other actions have had. All right, Dr. Sherman, thank you as, as always for coming in. Thank you. After initially announcing their decision in 2017, the United States and Israel are scheduled to take their leave from the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, today. And though the Israeli Foreign Ministry is expected to comment on UNESCO today as well, neither country has made any indication that they intend to reverse this decision. The move is a long time coming as well, as the cultural heritage body has caused much divide in the Middle East with the resolutions that both Israel and the United States have decried as consistently anti-Semitic and biased. For example, declaring archaeological and holy sites in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and other parts of Israel as solely Palestinian or Muslim in significance, like the Tomb of the Patriarchs and the Temple Mount. In fact, just this past summer, Prime Minister Netanyahu remarked that since 2009, quote, UNESCO has passed 71 resolutions condemning Israel and only two resolutions condemning all other countries combined. This is simply outrageous, end quote. He then added that in withdrawing, Israel and the United States have, quote, made a clear moral statement that UNESCO's anti-Semitism will no longer be tolerated. If and when UNESCO ends its bias against Israel, stops denying history, and starts standing up for the truth, Israel will be honored to rejoin, end quote. Israel and the United States first began their protest against UNESCO by ending their financial contributions in 2011. The failure to pay dues resulted in a loss of voting rights in 2013. And finally, a complete rejection and withdrawal from the organization in 2017, set to begin tomorrow, after four more years of continued slander and condemnation, or as Netanyahu called it, quote, the mark of anti-Semitism, end quote. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife Sara met with Brazilian Christian Friends of Israel in Rio de Janeiro on Sunday. And at the event, Netanyahu said, quote, we have no better friends in the world than the evangelical community, and the evangelical community has no better friend in the world than the state of Israel. Additionally, he said that, quote, if you're a Christian in the Middle East, there's only one place that you're safe. There's only one place where the Christian community is growing, thriving, prospering, and that's in the state of Israel, end quote. Netanyahu also said that this is a matter of the deepest sympathy in recognizing our common traditions and heritage, adding that Israel and Jerusalem are one, citing the Jewish people's biblical connections to the city. He also noted that President Bolsonaro's first name in Hebrew is Yair, the name of Netanyahu's son as well. And he said that in Hebrew this means, quote, he who brings light. And I think that we now have an opportunity together to bring a lot of light to the people of Brazil and to the people of Israel. This is an alliance of brothers, end quote.
Now, these comments come on the third day of Netanyahu's landmark six-day official visit to Brazil, scheduled for the inauguration of Brazilian President-elect Jair Bolsonaro, who will take office January 1st. But they also reflect his comments on Sunday when Netanyahu told leaders of Brazil's Jewish community in Rio that Bolsonaro told him that moving the Brazilian embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was a matter of when and not if. This is a partnership that is meant meaning to happen, is meant to happen, and we're going to make it happen very fast. Mr. Bolsonaro also said this, I will move the embassy to Jerusalem. It's not a question of if, just a question of when. <laughs> President Trump said the same thing. He moved the embassy, and President Bolsonaro would move the embassy as well. He accepted my invitation to visit Israel in the uh, in uh, uh, the coming months, and he's going to do it, he said, by March. And I look forward to receiving him with the same spirit and the same brotherhood that he received me and that you are receiving us. Finally, after a few weeks of intense searches, the two children kidnapped by members of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish cult Lev Tahol were found in Mexico, and they're safe. Al-TV's Joy Gavijon is here with more on this update. Joy? Yes, Aaron. Thankfully, the two teenagers, 14-year-old Yante Teller and 12-year-old Dante Teller, were rescued on Friday, finalizing the search that took weeks. Uh, during this operation, three members of Left Tower were arrested for kidnapping the kids back in September 8th. And, and the victims are Sarah Teller's children, the sister of Left Tower's leader, Nachman el -Bans. Exactly, yes. The kids were abducted from their home in upstate New York, and they were taken outside the country all the way to Mexico, and that's why it took so many weeks to find them. All right, so and how did they find them then? Well, U.S. Federal Attorney Jeffrey Berman explained that the operation was conducted by the FBI together with the New York police and Mexican authorities. According to Berman, the kids were found in the Mexican city of Tenango del Aire, and they are said to be reunited with their mother very soon. Now, we have to remember that Sara fled from Guatemala to the U.S. in 2017, escaping from Levtor with her six children. And two of them, uh, two of which were the ones who were kidnapped. Yes. So the leaders that were originally arrested in Mexico and deported to the U.S. were now arrested in New York, and apparently they are going to face charges for kidnapping, sexual abuse, extortion, and child abuse even. And among them, again, I, I'm assuming Nachman Elbranz, uh, the leader of the, the sect and right. Sarah's brother. Yes, uh, he is actually also the son of the former leader Shlomo Elbranz, who died in 2017, but also faced, faced similar accus accusations. Shlomo was accused of kidnapping a child in New York back in 1994, and then he escaped to Canada where he got a refugee status. So. So, so, the cult, so the cult was based in Canada for some years, we know that. Yes. Uh, and then they relocated themselves to Guatemala where they're still located. Yes, exactly. Currently, Lev Tower, who follows a very extremist practice of Judaism, has around 230 members. Uh, among other things, it, Lev Tower is accused for forcing marriages between minors and adults, and as I said, child abuse. All right, well, luckily the two children are safe uh, and will be reunited with their mother, Sarah. Thanks for the update, Joy. Of course, Aaron. Israeli supermodel Bar Rafaeli has just made headlines again, uh, but this time not for her sunglasses brand. Instead, prosecutors are preparing to indict the top model on a slew of financial offenses, and ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with the details. Thanks, Aaron. Well, according to Chadashot News, prosecutors will soon charge the supermodel with tax offenses, perjury, and money laundering pending a hearing due to the fact that she reportedly lied in saying she was living most of her time outside of Israel and failed to report pricey gifts and celeb discounts that she received to Israel's tax authority. All right, so this sounds very familiar. Yeah. Uh, this isn't the first time Rafaeli has been connected to such mm. accusations, is Right, it? that's right. Actually, just last June, Rafaeli appealed a massive bill that was handed to her by the tax authority, which basically determined that the supermodel had been hiding tens of millions of shekels of income in several cases of tax evasion, which also included her falsely claiming to be living outside of the country, like I said before, during her Leonardo DiCaprio years of 2009 to 2010, where she was saying she was living with her then-famous actor boyfriend in Hollywood during the period covered by the tax bill. However, the tax authority was apparently unswayed by her argument, saying that because they were never married, that she was registered at a, as a non-resident. Rafaeli apparently also owned no assets outside of Israel and that the relationship had its ups and downs. Um, her claims were invalid. All right, so what did end up happening with that then? Right. So investigators followed up on her claims and also realized that Rafaeli was living in two luxury apartments in Tel Aviv at the time, which were rented in her brother and mother's name. However, it was reported that the supermodel admitted to that, but didn't know that who was paying for the rent. 
fishy. On top of that, an investigation into her taxes also reportedly showed that Rafaeli had received a Range Rover vehicle in exchange for publicity in a public relations for the British car company. However, it was also found that the contracts with the car companies also included that the parties would keep the agreement a secret. And the taxable value on the cars would have been hundreds of thousands of shekels. So this is all very confusing and very intense. All right. Well, well listen, I mean, if, these, if any of these claims do actually come out to be true, that would be extremely unfortunate extremely. considering that she has like all the money that any you know, person anyone... would ever need. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there shouldn't be really an excuse to lie. Agreed. I, suppose. Uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens, though. Yes. Uh, thanks for the update, Manuel. You're welcome. The Israeli National Insurance Institute, or Bituach Leumi, has finally released its annual poverty report for 2017, and the numbers paint a pretty tough looking picture, according to the report. Based on information gathered by the Central Bureau of Statistics, nearly 1.8 million people in Israel live below the poverty line, over 800,000 of whom are children. That's 21.2 percent of the total population. Despite this depressing figure, however, the overall rates of poverty decreased over previous years for almost every metric mentioned. Families under the poverty line decreased from 28.8 percent in 2016 to 28.4 percent in 2017. And by that same token, the rates of children living in poverty also decreased from 31% to 29.6% in 2017. Finally, the rate of poverty among Arab families and Haredi families also fell from 49.2% to 47.1% and from 45.1% to 43.1% in 2017, respectively. For the elderly and for Olim, or new immigrant families in Israel, however, the poverty rates increased by 1% and 1.4% respectively to 21.8% and 18.4% in 2017. And among the unemployed, the rates are much worse, increasing 7 full percentage points to 76% under the poverty line in 2017. Israel thus, according to the OECD, also has the highest poverty rates out of any OECD member states. Eli Cohen, CEO of poverty-fighting organization Pitron Lev, called the reports disgraceful, though, as they don't offer enough in the way of action, and because they insult the poor and the rest of the Israeli public equally. He said that, quote, showing us an improvement rate of half a percent and regarding it as an achievement is like telling us that we're short-sighted. Don't show us numbers. Speak of people and mostly of actions. We're on the verge of a new parliamentary elections, and not a single candidate has anything to show for in terms of poverty. I call upon the leaders, old and new alike, to work on a plan applicable and measurable to break the cycle of poverty, end quote. The way we share content is rapidly ever-changing, and one of the most impressive new formats for posting images is posting in 3D through augmented reality, or AR. Uh, and my next guest is here to tell us all about the next best revolution in AR imagery, CEO and co-founder of REST AR, Bar Saraf. Bar, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, tell me about REST AR, exactly what it does and how it works. So REST AR enables every business owner to scan their products, uh, and convert them to 3D imaging and present them in augmented reality using their current platforms like applications and websites. And we are enhancing uh, the shopping experience of consumers and increasing sales for businesses. So this is, and this is not exactly like, say, you know, when people just take a, you know, a bunch of photos in the round. You're, no. We're talking about something that's really, you can manipulate it and move it around and really inspect it. Yeah, so it's uh, 3D. It's not a uh, 360 degrees uh, photo. So uh, uh, without 3D models, you can just see it, for example, on the table, like you can see in the video, and just wow. close up. And this is, and this is the AR. This that's, is the AR, that's yeah. incredible. You can see it also shoes on your uh, feet. You can see furniture when you design your apartment. That's amazing. All right, so, so who's using it then? Is it really commercial businesses and, and retailers? Uh, or is this going to be you know, for the independent guy who just wants to maybe show a really cool photo? So uh, we have started from retail. So we have uh, e-commerce uh, companies. We have uh, food delivery companies, uh, restaurants. But now we see also the gaming industry is very wow. interested in it. So we are all the time pivoting and uh, trying to find the best market fit. That's amazing. All right, so how did, you, like, how did you come up with this? Like, What gave you the idea to go down this route? So uh, we have started to create some augmented reality experience for one use case, for example, restaurants. Okay. So we started to build the augmented reality menu. And then we saw that the critical pro problem is how to create the content from uh, real world products. Mm. So uh, it took us a long time uh, uh, to understand how to do it so it will be easy to everyone. How, how different is it from, say, the current process of you know, 
I don't even know, is there a process yeah. of taking photos and transferring it into AR? Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so currently I have uh, some process that you should uh, uh, buy special equipment and got uh, special phot photographers and with, uh, using, with a lot of technical skills to use some uh, professional softwares. So we changed it and now everyone can take a short video with, with their uh, mobile device and then they will get... And put it the through the REST AR platform and, and there yeah. you go. Very easy to use, very easy to create. Incredible. All right, well, as I understand it, you're already working with Facebook and a number of other companies and you're soon going to be exp expanding your platform onto Instagram and, and other platforms as well? Yeah. All right, well, I can't wait to use it for myself, to be perfectly honest, just to, m just to mess around with it, if for nothing else. Um, Bao, thank you so much for coming in and telling us about this. REST AR, check it out. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming in. Thank you very much. Finally, it's New Year's Eve, and all the big pubs, clubs, and restaurants are gearing up for major crowds all night long. But according to a recent new study, Israeli patrons of the year's end festivities only make up a fifth of the total population. The other 78% considers it to be another ordinary Monday. The study, conducted by the Jewish People Policy Institute, surveyed over 3,000 Israeli Jews and has a margin of error of plus or minus 1.8%. And it also found that among secular and young Israelis, the number of those who celebrate New Year's Eve on December 31st actually shot up to 35%, or over a third of Israelis. But this is still pretty low when comparing to other Western states. The reasoning is actually quite simple, though. Israel follows the Hebrew calendar, which puts the Jewish New Year's, or Rosh Hashanah, on the first day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei, which usually falls around September. That being said, the Gregorian New Year's Eve, referred to as Sylvester in Hebrew, isn't the only celebration around this time anyhow. About 8% of Israeli Jews celebrate Novi God, which is a secular Christian holiday on New Year's Day, and it's mostly just celebrated by Israelis originating in the former Soviet Union. Additionally, and mostly among the completely secular society, of course, nearly 70,000 Jewish households even have a Christmas tree in order to celebrate Novigod, which is also typically a gift-giving holiday. The number of those who celebrate Novigod or any other New Year's celebration in December drops exponentially, however, among the religious sects, with just 1% of the Haredi population celebrating Novigod at all, none of whom exchange gifts or have a tree. And now speaking of New Year's Eve, we thought we'd take you for a very special ride down memory lane and look at some of the biggest moments in Israel in 2018. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, with all the different people in Israel getting ready to celebrate the new year in their own ways, we thought today's word should be givun or diversity. Now, givun or diversity can refer to a population as being diverse or meguvan, or you might just be talking about a givun or variety of colors on a palette or in a salad bar. Whatever the case, just remember that givun or diversity is a good thing, since if nothing else, a good givun can expose you to all sorts of new things. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be cloudy with a chance of light showers and a low of around 51 or 11 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow is expected to be partly cloudy with a slight rise in temperatures and a high of about 66 or 19 degrees Celsius. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.75 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.